I'd like to welcome you all to Surgical Considerations for Gastrointestinal Stromal Tumor. During this seminar, all participants will be in a listen-only mode, and there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation using questions submitted through the Q&A feature. Please remember that information provided in this web seminar is not intended as a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. My name is Sarah Rothschild, the Executive Director of the LifeRaft Group. We would like to thank Genentech, Blueprint, Decipher, and Novartis for their educational grants for today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Blakely completed a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering followed by medical school at Drexel University. He went on to general surgery residency at Brown University. During residency, he spent two years of dedicated research time at the Center for Biomedical Engineering, developing a device for tissue engineering applications. That work then led to a National Science Foundation grant and a patent. Dr. Blakely then completed his fellowship in complex general surgical oncology at City of Hope National Medical Center. Dr. Blakely is currently a surgical oncologist specializing in peritoneal surface malignancies and soft tissue sarcomas. And one of the primary focuses of his research includes improving surgical treatment and ex vivo tumor modeling of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And over the summer, Dr. Blakely um, attended our LightFest conference and his talk was very well received and we're excited that he's back again for a webinar um, to touch again on the topic of surgery and jest. So I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Blakely to present to us today. All right, well, first, thank you very much for that very nice introduction and for the opportunity to give this webinar. Uh, when I was at LifeFest, I think it was a great opportunity to meet with patients and families uh, and other providers as well I think one of the things that I took away from it was that the, um, there's other opportunities for surgery. And I think that um, listening to patient stories, um, unfortunately, some had been told that they were unresectable. Uh, and I think that there's opportunities for surgical interventions in GISTs. And so I wanted to start with some basics and then move on to talking about surgery for metastatic disease. I'll provide some specific case examples of uh, patients we've had here at the NIH, and then also some potential future directions of, of where we can go from where we are right now. So starting off uh, with surgery for the primary tumor, this is a recap of the talk that I gave at LifeFest and looking at uh, specific considerations for the primary tumor itself. So one major topic of conversation is that of surgical approach, and of course, as we move on in time, people are uh, using minimally invasive approaches to removing these tumors as much as is appropriate. And so, you know, what are some of the criteria that we would use as a surgeon to decide if minimally invasive surgery is the way to go as opposed to an open incision? And some of the criteria include the lack of a second primary tumor or evidence of spread of that tumor outside of the stomach. And I'll, I'll center the discussion mostly around the stomach itself is exposed to small intestine just because that is the most frequent uh, area of occurrence of gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Um, other criteria include size, and so tumors up to five centimeters in diameter based on imaging is usually a reasonable cutoff just because when tumors are larger than that, of course, the incision needed to extract that can be pretty sizable itself. And so that diminishes some of the benefit of a minimally invasive approach. The location in the stomach is also important. And so the ideal location would be along the body of the stomach or and along the greater curve of the stomach, as opposed to along the lesser curve, which is closer to the liver and uh, associated with more um, vascular structures. Um, and then also the growth of the tumor, as far as uh, endophytic versus exophytic. When we think of an exophytic tumor, it means that it's growing out from the stomach into the peritoneal cavity. That tends to be uh, more easily identified at the time of surgery and also usually requires removing less normal stomach in order to remove the mass as opposed to an endophytic mass. Again, these are rough guidelines as opposed to hard and fast rules. But as we've seen over recent years, the use of minimally invasive approaches has certainly increased over time. 
When we look at the primary tumor, one of the primary goals of removing it is to achieve a negative margin. And so sometimes we call it an R0. And what that means is that there's no microscopic tumor cells at that margin. Um, in the setting of a microscopic positive or R1 margin, historically it was associated with decreased recurrence-free survival, although uh, adjuvant or post-operative treatment with imatinib has helped bring those survival curves essentially together uh, when we compare folks who have had an R0 versus an R1 resection. Uh, and even though there might be a decrease in recurrence-free survival, there really is not a significant impact on overall survival. And because of this, there's no clear benefit of going back to surgery to achieve a negative or R0 margin. Uh, when we think about the extent of resection, most often it's determined by the anatomy. And so for a, a gastric gist, the proximity to the, either the, the esophagus or to the pylorus is going to limit the ability to have a more limited resection. Um, but sometimes when the tumor is close to the esophagus or close to the pylorus, that's an indication to give imatinib for imatinib-sensitive tumors before surgery in order to try and make them smaller and facilitate a less extensive resection and preserve more of that stomach. Um, when we think about multifocality, it's another consideration that's more likely to occur in the setting of wild type, uh, particularly SDH uh, deficient GIST. Um, and in that, among those uh, patients with SDH deficient GISTs, there's a suggestion of a role for risk reduction. And this is something that we've been exploring most recently along with uh, other centers like uh, University of California, San Diego and uh, Oregon, seeing that SDH deficient just tend to arise more in the distal stomach. And so is there a relative benefit to a distal gastrectomy as opposed to a wedge gastrectomy, particularly for young patients who may be at risk for developing additional primaries in the future? Possibly, but of course, that has to be determined in the setting of ideally a clinical trial. When we are in the operating room and we're removing gists, the handling of the gist is really important because what we want to avoid is rupture. And in order to avoid rupture, what we will do is handle tissues that are adjacent to the tumor as opposed to the tumor itself. We want to preserve the pseudo capsule that gists generally have because the the inner part of the gist is very soft. It falls apart quite easily, but that pseudo capsule helps keep it together and it allows us to manipulate the tumor directly or indirectly without rupturing it, but that has a limit. And to that end, we also want to avoid morselating it or basically um, crushing it in order to facilitate its extraction through the skin, even if it's inside a plastic retrieval bag, just because there might be some microscopic perforations of that bag, and we may leave that patient at risk for recurrence in the abdominal wall or in the peritoneal cavity. And when we look at historical patient outcomes, for those who have undergone, again, that R1 resection versus an R0, there's that decrease in recurrence-free survival in particular. But we see that in the setting of tumor rupture, that recurrence-free survival uh, diminishes even more rapidly. And so that's why keeping that tumor intact is, is really one of the primary goals during the surgery. A lot of folks will ask about, well, what about lymph nodes if they're involved? And when lymph nodes are involved, it's uncommon to happen in non-wild type gists. It's more common in wild type gists. It's rare, but can happen outside of the abdomen or the pelvis, such as in the cervical lymph nodes or in the axillary lymph nodes. And when we are presented with this scenario, the guiding principle is to just remove the lymph nodes that are clearly abnormal. And so that's based off of preoperative imaging and intraoperative, both visual and physical inspection of these areas of the lymph nodes. And so this is an example. This patient had a recurrent uh, gist actually behind the stomach, and this was associated with the momentum or the fat around the stomach, not the stomach itself. And then this here was a lymph node along the lesser curve of the stomach. And so this was the only abnormal lymph node in the area. And so that's the one that we removed. When we look at the primary tumor, we also think about tumor grading. And so with GISTs, that's assessed in terms of mitotic rate. 
because that's the number of mitoses per either 50 high powered fields or five millimeters squared, uh, depending on how it's reported, they're equivalent. But here we see highlighted these mitotic uh, figures of cells actively dividing within the tumor tissue. And the risk of recurrence of disease after removal of the primary is assessed using several factors. So one of those factors is size, uh, the mitotic rate, and also the location of where this gist is coming from, whether it's the stomach or somewhere outside of the stomach. Uh, the second most common place being, of course, the small intestine. Um, and so these, you know, a lot of this information is really based off of the non-wild type, the more traditional sort of uh, kit or PDGFRA mutant gists. Some of this holds true for wild type gists, specifically SDH deficient gists, but some of it doesn't. So for example, the impact of mitotic rate is less well-defined among patients who have SDH deficient gists, for example. So moving on to surgery for metastatic disease, and I think this is really where I wanted to focus most of the, the time for the webinar today. When we're assessing patients who have metastatic involvement of GIST, what we are taking into consideration are things such as signs and symptoms. So some of the strongest indications for surgical intervention would be um, obstruction, intestinal obstruction or gastric obstruction, pain from the tumors, and that could be associated with obstructive symptoms, or it could be from capsular stretch on the liver, bleeding, which can happen with those endophytic gastric gists or from small intestinal gists, because the lining of the stomach or the lining of the small intestine may erode, and when that happens, bleeding may occur. And anemia is one of the more common reasons why some people may come to medical attention. Uh, and also patient anxiety, I think, is something that we probably don't talk about enough. As far as it's uh, when, when patients are getting regular scans and we're seeing increases over time in some of the tumor sizes, that can be very anxiety provoking. And I think that um, that can be an indication for surgery in, in certain situations. Uh, we think about surgical intervention. We also want to think about the organ systems involved. Most frequently, we're talking about the liver and the peritoneal surfaces, and sometimes we're talking about both. And then also for um, patients who have systemic therapy options, such as the KIT and PDGFRA mutants, um, or for patients who have been on uh, other treatments such as sunitinib for SDH deficiencies or on trial treatment for the, for the same, then we want to also assess what has been the response or the change over time in the setting of that treatment. And this was a study um, from a few years ago looking at primarily KIT and PDGFRA mutant uh, gists, and seeing that the patients who had response to treatment or stability of treatment had uh, improved survival compared to patients who had uh, progression despite that systemic treatment. However, this is just, again, a guideline, and you know, not a um, hard and fast rule, but it's part of how do we assess patients and how do we counsel patients. But one thing I really wanted to impress upon folks is that Resectability, meaning the ability to say that we can either remove or ablate or burn all of the disease that we can see on imaging, that assessment, first of all, needs to be individualized to the patient, but also fundamentally it's in the eye of the beholder. What I mean is that the surgeon making the assessment is going to have their own um, experiences, levels of comfort, um, and I think that for that reason, it's very important to get multiple opinions. I'd say at least two, if not three or four, to really know, because I think sometimes that term unresectable is um, used and perhaps maybe not uh, as appropriately as it should be. When we think about the goals of surgery, uh, again, one of the uh, primary uh, reasons to operate is to relieve active symptoms. Uh, I think it's a different uh, consideration when folks are truly asymptomatic, but also I think sometimes people have more symptoms than they realize because sometimes they can be rather vague or some folks may downplay them a little bit. Uh, one goal of surgery could be to reset the clock on the disease burden, and that's looking at patients who have had slow growth over time and aren't comfortable saying that 
10% per year is, you know, something that they are um, comfortable with and, and want to continue um, to potentially experience with future scans. And one of the other goals is we don't want to uh, compromise patients' ability to be eligible for future clinical trials. I think we're in a better position now than we were 10 years ago as far as different clinical trials being open and available to patients and the potential for novel treatments in the next 5, 10, 20 years, I think is much greater as there's also been more interest from industry and from providers in identifying novel treatment options. And what we don't want to do is, is perform a surgery today that's going to compromise their ability based off of either liver function, kidney function, or something else where they might have a treatment option in a few years. Um, but part of it is also to say, can we get things under control for a period of time? And by the time progression may be a consideration, perhaps another treatment option is available. And so part of the assessment is also um, sometimes we'll use diagnostic laparoscopy for patients who might have peritoneal sarcomatosis, meaning spread of the just tumors around the peritoneal surfaces, provides more of a visual assessment and is complementary to imaging. We will employ a lot of combined liver resection and ablation in order to achieve a debulking of the liver specifically. And sometimes in order to facilitate that, we'll use venovenous bypass. And so we'll talk a little bit more about each of these separately. The diagnostic laparoscopy gives us that visual inspection of the peritoneal surfaces. Since some of these tumor nodules are just too small to be seen by CT or even high resolution MRI or PET scan. It also provides us an opportunity for tissue harvest and analysis, and it can be repeated over time. And so if we perform the laparoscopy before treatment is to start, then we can repeat it after treatment to look at treatment response in a different way as opposed to just imaging. And we can also, by virtue of the biopsies, monitor the mutational profile of tumors over time and see if, for example, uh, kit mutant tumors have developed additional mutations over time or not. As far as combined liver resection and ablation, we'll tend to prefer to resect larger tumors. Our size threshold is usually about three centimeters and also more peripheral tumors since they're more easily accessible. But then smaller tumors uh, deeper in the liver can be uh, very well treated with ablation. And so ablation is where we will stick a, a microwave needle into the center of the tumor. And then based off of both the wattage that we use and the time, we can determine how large of an ablation zone we'll have. What we want to do is encapsulate that tumor and a small margin of normal liver tissue around that. And that goes along with our, our dual goals whenever we're talking about a liver debulking. On the one hand, we want to remove or ablate as much tumor tissue as possible and try to render patients as close to no evidence of disease as we can. And on the other hand, we want to preserve as much normal liver tissue as possible in order to, again, maintain patients' eligibility for potential future clinical trials. And vena venous bypass is a technique that we've used uh, more frequently here at the NIH in order to facilitate some of these more complex resections. And it allows us to control the blood flow through the vena cava that's running behind the liver. And if we need to, we can also use this to essentially totally isolate the liver of blood flow for a period of time and that helps reduce the blood loss, especially in very complex resections. What it also does is allow us to uh, remove and reconstruct a portion of the vena cava if needed. And that's sometimes a consideration for that part of the vena cava behind the liver, because it's above the veins that drain the kidneys, but below the level of the heart and often below the level of where the veins from the liver drain into the vena cava as well. And it's something that we've done a few times now here at the NIH, and um, not just for gastrointestinal thrombal tumors, but sometimes for other disease processes. Um, but this bypass allows us to, to be able to perform that when necessary. However, there are, of course, some limitations for surgery. Um, you know, we cannot remove what we cannot see. And we are, it is known that short interval recurrence can happen. But when we're talking about a liver, for example, where there's a lot of different GIST nodules, there's also likely microscopic areas of involvement. 
and that may not become apparent until after surgery. And so that's part of my counseling is to say, this may happen. But by the same token, what many patients will experience is maybe that recurrence will happen in three to six months after surgery. But once those spots have appeared, many times they will stay relatively stable over time. And so sometimes what we'll do is offer percutaneous ablation with our interventional radiology colleagues in order to uh, essentially burn those smaller uh, recurrences down the line as a kind of a second stage to that liver debulking if needed. And another limitation is that really only so many major cytoreductions are possible. Uh, whenever we do these extensive surgeries, of course, we will often provoke a lot of scar tissue formation, getting back into the abdomen and being able to fully mobilize the liver, as an example, gets more difficult as patients have undergone more of these types of surgeries. And uh, next I want to move on to some case examples. And I think this is where um, we can kind of put some pictures to what we've been talking about. Uh, as a warning, there are some uh, photos of either in the operating room or of um, removed tumors. Uh, so if anybody's particularly sensitive, I just want to give you a heads up. There aren't too many, but there are some uh, photos um, throughout this portion of the talk. So first, uh, this was a um, young patient with uh, multifocal primary gist associated with uh, SDH deficiency. As we move through the MRI, we can see that there's a large primary tumor right back here behind the stomach next to the spleen. There was another tumor here, and there's another one right here. And so based on the MRI, we knew we had at least three or four primary gists uh, in the stomach here. And at the time of the operation, we found three or four others associated with the stomach wall that were just too small to be distinguished from the um, stomach itself. This patient ended up undergoing a uh, subtotal gastrectomy, so only a small cuff of stomach that was unaffected was able to be left, uh, but overall did uh, quite well uh, since then. And this is a picture of the stomach itself. So this is the, the back of the stomach. And we can see that large uh, primary gist coming from the stomach that was next to the spleen before. And then over here is one of the other gists. And right next to it is actually a segment of colon that had to be removed since it was so stuck on. What we didn't want to do was try and preserve the colon for two reasons. One is that if we err too close to the side of the colon, we could damage the colon. And if that's not recognized, that can cause problems at, in the patient's recovery. And on the other side, if we entered too, side, uh, too close to the primary gist, then we would have risked rupture. Um, and I think that that would have fundamentally changed uh, the patient's disease. Here's another example of a patient who had a rapidly enlarging uh, primary gist in the stomach. And you can see here, this is the mass and the radiologist will point that out, basically occupying the entire stomach. The patient had undergone a prior palliative gastrogenostomy, essentially connecting the stomach to the small bowel in order to bypass this area. Um, but even at the time of surgery, that gist was getting very close to that connection. And so that palliative connection is likely gonna be obstructed very soon. Uh, and this patient had been told previously that uh, this was not able to be removed. Uh, but through the performance of a Whipple operation, we were able to remove this. This is another view with the uh, CAT scan. So right around here is where that connection had been made with the small intestine right there. And uh, there was the primary. Uh, this is another patient who had a multifocal peritoneal gist. And you know, for this patient, we see a lot of tumors around the stomach, in the liver uh, as well, around the spleen here. As we come down, there's another mass right there. And then in the pelvis, there was a very large gist, as you can see, occupying essentially the entire pelvis. And this patient's primary complaints were that of um, bladder obstruction. And so it was very difficult for him to urinate. And although we had seen a lot of disease overall, he was in his mid seventies. Our counseling was that we should focus on the on the area that's provoking the symptoms that he was experiencing and impairing his quality of life. And to that end, we removed that just in the pelvis, and he ended up um, doing much better after that from the uh, urinary perspective. Uh, 
One thing that we'll do for folks who have multiple spots in the liver that we're either cutting out or ablating is we will uh, track them in order to tell us or remind us what, what we ended up cutting out, what we ended up ablating. And for example, we'll put the characteristics over this um, gist within the liver. We ablated it using 75 watts of power and we did it for one minute. Um, and uh, the track ablating means that we are burning as we withdraw the needle in order to essentially cauterize that track since the liver is so vascular, it has a tendency to bleed. Um, but this also allows us on future imaging, what's gonna show up here is a fluid pocket. And so we'll be able to know that at this part in the liver, that's where we did uh, ablate a tumor in the past. That's helpful for reference. And so this is another patient who had a primary tumor as well as liver, liver metastases in the setting of the STH deficiency. And we can see the gist right here in the back of the stomach. And it had a, a bit of an endophytic sort of appearance. And so the patient actually had um, anemia requiring blood transfusion. Um, and removing that was helpful in order to treat the anemia. And then at the same time, since we were already in there, then we did a combination of uh, cutting out and ablating of uh, four tumors that we cut out, four tumors that we ablated in order to clear her liver. And, you know, people will probably notice that this says not seen. And sometimes there is some discrepancy between what we can see in the operator room using ultrasound versus what we see on the MRI. The MRI is often very, very sensitive down to two or three millimeters. And it can be very difficult to find some of those very small areas at the time of surgery. But of course, we do the best we can. And the um, MRI provides a usually a very good roadmap uh, to be able to identify all the areas that we're concerned about. This is another patient who was a young patient with um, SDH deficiency who'd been followed over multiple years with serial imaging. And the primary tumor had been removed previously. And this was a restaging CT done back in 2019. What you notice here behind the liver is this large fluid filled mass. And there's some solid components. There's also some masses between the stomach and the spleen and, you know, several areas of concern throughout the liver. And the CAT scan is generally pretty good at seeing some of these things, especially when they reach a certain size threshold in the liver. But I think that what, the, uh, what uh, we'll often recommend is an MRI. And I think it will be pretty obvious why we recommend the MRI. When we look at this sort of a phase, everything that's lighting up with this sort of a gray is consistent with GIST, whereas this darker gray is normal liver. And I think the MRI really highlights much better what's normal liver, what's abnormal, and gives us a much better roadmap. And so for anybody who has any concern for liver involvement, the MRI, I think, is critical. And it will help us distinguish uh, things like hemangiomas, which are uh, abnormal proliferations of blood vessels versus cysts versus adenomas uh, of the liver itself versus metastatic disease. And so it really gives us a much better idea of um, areas that we need to focus on. And this is another picture looking from the front back. And we can see, again, these different areas uh, lighting up. And that area in the back and that right liver full of fluid, I think was probably a gist that had ruptured, but fortunately had been contained by the liver capsule. And this is what it looked like when it was removed. It was a very large mass as we knew it would be uh, based on the preoperative imaging. You can see we removed this with some of the smaller gists in the liver also attached all as one piece. And you see based on the size scale, this is about 15 centimeters or about six inches. Um, um, on, on, in each dimension. Uh, and this was a patient who was also symptomatic from a, a pain perspective as far as the capsular stretch and upper abdominal pain that the patient been having for some time leading up to surgery. Um, this is another one just demonstrating, uh, actually, sorry, this is his uh, post-op scan. And so we can see that there's quite a difference between where we were pre-op compared to post-op. And this was the patient I mentioned before who went on to subsequent um, percutaneous ablation for some areas that did develop short interval recurrence. Uh, 
um, but he uh, overall tolerated that quite well. And I think certainly is in a fundamentally different position than where he was from before surgery. Another example of a patient who was at the time of diagnosis found to have very extensive liver involvement. Again, this is in the setting of SDH deficiency with a large central tumor here, certainly lots of uh, larger and also smaller and medium-sized tumors on the right side of the liver. And then this is the view kind of from front to back. And we'll, I'll draw attention to this once again, because I think one question is, people will have, well, what does that look like when we're looking at it in the operating room? And so this is a picture from the operation where we can see that large central tumor is here within the liver and you see normal liver around it. And then there's a small gist right here as well. And this is what it looks like when we're, when we remove that. As you can see, it's a bit of a, a defect here where that tumor was, but certainly it's smaller since this these just tend to push as opposed to invade. They can shell out pretty easily and we can preserve most of that liver tissue there. And then this is the small defect that's a result of removing the smaller uh, satellite just on the, on the surface of the liver as well. And then as a final case example, this is one where we had venovenous -vena -vena bypass set up. We actually didn't end up using it. But the reason why we had it set up was because we had two tumors, one here and one right here. And the vena cava is right here. And it's pretty well flattened by these tumors. And the other thing is that we'll appreciate better on the other imaging when we're looking at it from front to back. These tumors are very close to the patient's heart. And so given that aspect, what we want to do is have the venous bypass set up and ready to go just in case. This is a patient who had uh, non-wild type just, so it was a kit mutant, but had also gone through essentially all approved lines of therapy. Um, but this was the, these were the only areas of disease. And um, the patient had been considered for liver-directed therapy, um, but it had issues with that as far as trying to selectively target these areas. But the fact of the matter was there were only two spots and uh, we were able to get a good outcome by removing those two areas. But again, we, we have a low threshold for having that vena venous bypass available just in case we end up needing it. And so I'll wrap up just by talking about some potential future directions. So, of course, we were particularly thinking about um, the metastatic setting. We would always like to have as many options as possible for systemic control. And so for folks who have uh, GISTs with uh, KIT or PDGFRA mutations, you know, one question right now is what is the optimal sequencing of the approved therapies? A lot of times people have to go through imatinib, then sunitinib, then regorafenib, and then something else, but maybe repretinib would be more of a consideration as second or third line therapy as, a, as opposed to fourth line therapy. And so there are trials being designed and, and, and carried out in order to try and determine that sequence, um, particularly when patients have known second mutations within their GISTs. And there's ongoing clinical trials uh, for folks who particularly have SDH deficiency. So looking at not just temozolomide, but then the combination with the Inhibrix um, death receptor five um, uh, therapeutic um, agent, and then also rogaratinib. Uh, so there's various sites around the United States that are um, uh, satellite sites or the primary sites for these two trials. And then another question is, since a lot of other disease processes are being evaluated for the benefit of immunotherapy, it still remains to be determined what is that benefit and, and how can we potentially use immunotherapy for gastrointestinal tumor tumors. And then looking at improved regional control. So I briefly touched about, uh, uh, talked about liver-directed therapies. So one area of interest is that of radioembolization using yttrium-90. Um, I think that there are some anecdotal evidence. I, there's a case series that I've heard that is being put together to talk about uh, outcomes as far as uh, not just immediate and short-term outcomes, but also long-term durability of that. Um, there's also, we use a hepatic artery infusion pump for uh, other processes such as colorectal liver metastases, and maybe there's a role for that with uh, metastatic disease limited to the liver. And then one area that 
people have questions, had a lot of questions about and that I'm working on trying to identify is how can we uh, create a workflow or, or a potential option for liver transplantation for folks who have a long history of relatively stable disease or where it's limited only to the liver, is liver transplantation something that can be entertained? Um, and I think the biggest rate limiting step to that is identifying a transplant center uh, with providers who are willing to consider that. But there was a case report um, published uh, from a European center a few years ago. I think there's been more interest as we've looked at liver transplantation for colorectal uh, metastases to the liver as well. And so I think this is hopefully something that can be entertained soon. Um, and then given my other interest in peritoneal surface malignancies from colon cancer, ovarian cancer, or mesothelioma, one question is for patients who have peritoneal sarcomatosis, are there peritoneal directed therapies that we can use to improve regional control of the peritoneum itself? And right now we don't have a, a great rationale for using chemotherapy like we do with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy for ovarian cancer or colon cancer, but someday we might have something that we can use in the peritoneum as a perfusion in order to reduce the risk of recurrence in that area. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, this is our clinical trial looking at uh, taking care of patients with GISTs here at the NIH and contact information for both uh, Audra Satterwhite, the research nurse on our study, as well as for me. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Blakely, and I'm glad that you, you mentioned in the end about that study. It's something that we featured in a previous webinar and, and presentation, so um, it's definitely a, a hopeful option for our patients to consider um, the study that you're doing in terms of uh, the surgical site at NIH. Um, I, we do have a, a few questions that have come in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share them. Before I do, I just want to make the caveat again that this is not a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. So obviously you need to speak to your uh, practitioner in terms of your individual cases. But um, in a general sense, we do have a, a patient uh, just was unknown to exist and ruptured and there was a GI bleed and after emergency resection was not prescribed a matinib. Couple questions were, um, if he started adjuvant therapy, would it have limited the chance of recurrence? And he's about five and a half years after resection with metastatic gist uh, that occurred in the liver. That's one part. And then the second part was, if he's been on a mat in five years with stable mets, should he consider ablation? I think, you know, when we think about the imatinib, it may have delayed it, uh, the recurrence to some extent. But we, we know that with GISTs, much of the time, additional mutations will develop. And so it may, may have delayed that to some extent, but probably not prevented it entirely. Um, and as far as ablation, I think for folks who have a long history of disease, where you know, dealing with it for several years, we have stability with the imatinib, um, the question of when to intervene, it depends. Uh, I think some folk, some surgeons would say when we see evidence of progression in one or more of them, and some surgeons may just target the ones that are progressing and leave the others at the time, unless it's easily removed at the same surgical intervention. Um, and the other is based on symptoms. So certainly if there's more pain, discomfort, uh, or any issues with obstruction, those would be compelling reasons to consider surgery sooner rather than later. And the other is, I think, the anxiety in the sense that for some patients, knowing that those tumors are there, and especially with growth over time, even if it's not meeting strict criteria of 20% by imaging per year to say that it's progressive disease, quote unquote, um, may be a reason for patients to consider intervention sooner rather than later as well. Thank you. Can liver surgeries be pretty aggressive? Okay to take out much liver tissue because liver tissue can regenerate. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think the one of the benefits or actually one of the, the positive sides of operating on the liver for GIST uh, 
is that pseudo capsule. That capsule really pushes liver tissue away from the tumors. And that's why when I showed that post-operative MRI, if we hadn't talked about what had happened and didn't show his pre-operative MRI, you may not realize just how much disease that patient had had. And so we will take as, as little normal liver around that as possible. And so when sometimes when we're thinking about complex liver resections, people will talk about volume metrics. And the volume metrics refer to how much normal liver volume is going to be left at the end of surgery. But we actually, we started doing that and then we stopped. And the reason is because much of the time we're only removing maybe 10, 20% at most of normal liver tissue. And that regeneration process probably doesn't kick in until we take more like half of the liver tissue or a more substantial proportion. And so most folks won't look like they have necessarily liver regeneration, but it's more, it's redistribution of that normal liver tissue. But it allows us to be more aggressive, remove more of these nodules, burn more of them as well, because we're not getting to that risk of either liver failure or long-term liver impairment, where again, that eligibility for clinical trials may be challenged and we really don't want to take that away from folks because surgery is fundamentally a local treatment. And we know that for some folks, unfortunately, it is a systemic problem. Right. And I, I am under no uh, misconception that for a local treatment that I am going to totally alter the systemic aspect of things. And I, I think that usually we have to have these, these sorts of treatment approaches in concert. So if we're going to talk about surgery, that's why we talk about the systemic treatments. And that's why we also talk about saying we want to preserve that eligibility for the future as much as possible because that may be needed ultimately. Right. Yeah, that's great that you're looking at the big picture. Uh, what are your thoughts on a total gastrectomy or, or not with a kit mutation? Yeah, I think we try to avoid the total gastrectomy as much as possible, but sometimes, you know, if it's really right at the esophagus, um, it can be really challenging. And I think that in surgical oncology, we often will cause more problems trying to preserve an organ by performing a non-standard operation than performing a standard operation, getting clean margins and the best outcome oncologically by getting those margins and, and getting everything clearly removed and also avoiding rupture. Um, and so, you know, it's a bit of a balance and a bit of a judgment. Um, we perform a lot of total gastrectomies here at the NIH. And the reason for that is that we have a large patient population with CDH1 mutations, and that predisposes to gastric cancer. And so there's a role for prophylactic total gastrectomy among those patients. And for that reason, we also have the infrastructure for taking care of those patients and counseling them both before surgery and after surgery. And I leverage that for our patients in the setting of when a total gastrectomy is necessary. Um, we try to make that as, as little as, as little of the time as possible, but if it really has to happen, then I think in the context of that support with um, nutritional support, um, which and, and counseling that happens from even starting before the surgery is really important for those outcomes. And so our nutrition team was really important uh, and played a huge role for the patient who had that subtotal gastrectomy because, you know, she ended up having some issues as far as nausea and food intolerance and working yeah. through that really uh, was important with our nutrition team, but they had experience with that based on how many other patients have come through and had extensive gastric surgery here. Yeah, it's great that um, you're paying attention to the quality of life um, for afterwards too. All right, so this patient has um, one eight by nine by seven and a half centimeter, just upper posterior to the stomach, currently taking imatinib for four months to reduce the tumor for surgery. Do we need to take out the whole stomach if the gist is located between the upper stomach and upper posterior to the stomach, even though the size is reduced around five centimeters? A great question. Maybe. Uh, maybe not, though. So one thing we've also done in the past um, is at the time of our operation, we'll have uh, our gastroenterology colleagues in the operating room and they can perform an endoscopy at the same time. 
And so when we think about how much stomach can we remove, we think not just about where the tumor is in relation to the end of the esophagus. We also think about if we were to cut this out and reconstruct it or to staple that part of the stomach in order to remove that just how big is the conduit? How big is the stomach that remains? And when there's a concern as far as how much stomach is going to be left, especially at the upper side, we can do that uh, endoscopy at the same time to look at what the proposed uh, stomach removal is going to, to appear like on the inside. And what we can also do is insufflate the stomach and stretch it out at the same time in order to get a better idea as well. But I think without looking at the images, without seeing the endoscopy results, it's very hard for me to say definitively yes or no. Um, you know, I think that it makes sense for a just that large and in that location to start the imatinib and see its effect. Uh, sometimes we won't see the full um, decrease in size for a good six months. And so even though it's already been four months, I'd say it might be worthwhile waiting another two just to see. Um, if there's any continued growth or reduction uh, in size of the tumor, and that may facilitate uh, a less extensive operation. But it, you know, I, I'm, it's hard for me to say one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a, uh, a mother who has a daughter with SDH deficient gist. She's going into surgery soon for an eight centimeter, mostly fluid filled gist on the lesser curvature. What does this fluid consist of? Is this sent to pathology? Is the tumor first aspirated to get out the fluid or how is this handled? Is this a recurrence two and a half years after multifocal tumors in her antrum were resected, including the pylorus? That's a great question. I think um, when we see these fluid filled things, that's why I think that a lot of times it, it indicates some sort of rupture that's fortunately been contained. I personally would not aspirate it because I think any time we puncture that pseudocapsule, then we risk fluid coming out and with fluid maybe cells. And so while you're dealing with what sounds like one spot of concern, I think sticking a needle on that may be more risk than it's worth. It's not gonna fundamentally change probably what the recommendations would be. Um, but you know, the what we aim to do is remove that just with all the fluid intact and send the whole thing as a package to pathology at the time of surgery. Excellent. Um, can a magnet dose reduction be considered after close to 10 years NED reducing 400 to 300? Good question. I will say I would defer to your, your treating oncologist. Um, if there's no major side effects or issues with the 400 milligram dose, um, then one might argue what's the difference with taking the 300 milligram dose if you're not going to have any benefit from a symptom perspective or side effect perspective. Um, but certainly the issue would be, well, what if recurrence did develop after the dose reduction, then, you know, there might be some retrospective uh, concern as far as that dose reduction having been done. Um, but I think that's you know, so I would probably say that if it's been 10 years with no evidence of disease and it's working for you and you're tolerating it, then I'd probably just continue with that. If it just is bleeding in the stomach, is that a rupture? Um, not quite. I would say the bleeding tends to be more from the mucosa. So when we think about the gists arriving, arising in the stomach or in the small bowel, um, gastric cancer, for example, comes from the mucosa, which is the inner lining of the stomach but the gists come from within the wall. And so that mucosa, that inner lining is covering that gist. So that's why on endoscopy, what people are looking for in order to biopsy a gist is, you know, it might be normal appearing mucosa, but you can see a mass effect. And so you have to stick a needle through the mucosa into the gist in order to get that biopsy. But what happens is if the gists have that endophytic growth where they're growing into the stomach as opposed to out of the stomach towards the peritoneum, that mucosa gets stretched, thins out, and erodes. And a lot of time, it's that mucosa that's bleeding. It's usually not considered a rupture. When I think about a rupture, I think about a free tumor rupture with cells spilling into the peritoneal cavity. Mm -hmm. And that would be fundamentally a different stage of disease for most okay. patients. Okay. 
Um, what about patients who have bone metastases? How is that handled from a, a surgical or radiological perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so most of the time, this is where uh, radiation is often considered to focally treat those bony metastases. Um, and we have seen some patients, particularly with SDH deficiency, who have had pretty extensive metastases in the bones. Um, if it's isolated, then the radiation can be helpful in order to keep it from growing. But the issue is pathologic fractures. And so the pathologic fractures could be uh, predisposed by the tumor itself, but then also the radiation, because it does weaken the normal bone around that. And so um, usually your orthopedic oncologists would be people to talk to as far as if there's an indication to remove that tumor and then um, put a prosthesis in to uh, support the bone. That's done in select circumstances. Much of the time it's probably done after the pathologic fracture has occurred. Um, if it's isolated disease and it's radiated and it's stable, that's what we would want to see if we're going to be talking about addressing something in the abdomen. So I think, you know, we, we don't want to focus just on the abdominal surgical portion of things. We also want to know the context of the, the gist from a global perspective. So mm -hmm. looking at the bones as part of that. Um, wow. Very comprehensive. I don't think we have any other questions that have come in. Um, but I think you gave a great overview. Um, the case examples, I think, were very illustrative of what you what you do in terms of surgical approaches. Uh, I think, it, did a question just come in? <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we can answer that one. Is there any risk with radiofrequency ablation of just tumor in the liver being missed and spreading throughout the liver? So radiofrequency ablation um, is probably not used quite as much as it used to be. Now we've moved over to microwave ablation. So we tend to use microwaves just because it's a single needle. We put it in the center of the tumor and it has a good radius of burning. Um, the radiofrequency ablation usually takes a little bit longer. Um, and so time on the operative table or time in the um, interventional radiology suite tends to be longer. Um, but some people have, you know, still prefer to use RFA over microwave ablation. But I don't think that there's a risk of a high risk of the tumor cells spreading from that area. The biggest risk with any ablative technique, whether it's microwave, whether it's radio frequency, or whether it's cryoablation using very, very cold temperatures in order to freeze the tumor and kill it that way, is inadequate coverage. And so that's where using intraoperative ultrasound or um, some places will have the ability for the percutaneous ablation to sink the ultrasound or CAT scan in the intra in the interventional radiology suite with the patient's preoperative MRI in order to um, provide potentially through computations a defined margin around that tumor using the ablation. That's probably the biggest risk though, is that it's an incomplete ablation and not all the tumor cells have been killed. And sometimes what happens is if we do stimulate any of that liver regeneration, well, along with that comes growth factors. And sometimes residual tumor cells can take advantage of those growth factors in order to regrow. But usually that'll manifest as a recurrence within the ablation site as opposed to a, somewhere else in the liver remote from that spot. Okay, well, we still have more questions coming in, which means that you are doing a great job answering <laughs> these questions. Um, it's a follow-up, I guess this patient has a familial gist and they wanted to know if that precludes one from a stomach res resection with a total gastrectomy being the only option. So it's a gastrectomy no, I, again. No, I, I don't think so. I, well, we, we first off don't have data to suggest a prophylactic gastrectomy is indicated. Um, I don't think that I would counsel anybody towards a total gastrectomy unless it was anatomically necessary, whether it's familial yeah. gist or non-familial gist. You know, it really is dictated by where the tumor is and if there's really no other way to clear it without a total gastrectomy. Um, 
But I think the counseling is different in the sense that we say, okay, we can go in, we're going to remove this gist. We may find very small other primary gists within the stomach, which, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we talk about that ahead of time, we would say we may convert from saying we'll do a partial gastrectomy to a more extensive gastrectomy. Mm -hmm. um, or the other scenario is that patients can develop recurrence or new primaries within the residual stomach in the future. And so yeah. maybe years. And that's why I usually wouldn't tend to recommend a total gastrectomy for patients because they have a familial type of gist because some patients will never develop another primary. And even if they do, it may be five, 10, 15 years until that happens. And so I think it's more about active observation and making sure that we're getting repeated imaging over time in order to identify those as early as possible to once again, be able to offer whenever possible, something less than a total gastrectomy. Right, makes sense. Um, this person has been contacted by a proton radiation group. How well do they work on Exxon 18? So proton radiation, um, there's not a lot of centers that perform that. I think that there has generally been a concept that radiation treatment is not as effective for gists as it might be for other sarcomas or other types of, of tumors. Um, but there has been some, uh, there have been patients of mine who have undergone targeted radiation therapy um, in certain places and have had good effect with some reduction in size over time, uh, or at least stability. And so whether it's proton therapy or another therapy, I don't think that there's, as to my knowledge, I don't think there's any case series of patients with GIST who have undergone protein, proton therapy. Um, I think if we were to extrapolate from radiation, like uh, use SBRT or stereotactic um, uh, body re body uh, radiation therapy. Um, sometimes we can get some response with that. I don't know. It's really standard though, and so I think right. the question is going to be, what is the goal? What is the expected outcome? And what are the alternatives? That's right. Really important to consider. Makes sense. Okay, I think we're going to um, complete the the questions um, for this presentation. I want to thank Dr. Blakely for his time today. I also want to reiterate. If you're interested in seeing Dr. Blakely's second opinion and also considering his study, please consider reaching out to the contacts on the slide in front of you uh, because um, it's a really, um, it's a center of excellence at the NIH and they do great work. And Dr. Blakely is a great surgeon. So we're really blessed that he was here today to share his expertise and, and knowledge. And I wanna thank everybody today for attending. Have a lovely day. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I, I do want to say one thing. I would say that if anybody has concerns and they would like images to be reviewed, by all means, you know, just let us know. I'm happy to take a look at CAT scans, MRIs, and what have you, and render an opinion. Does not mean that you have to come here um, and be, you know. But I think that uh, that second, third, fourth opinion is really valuable. So for anybody who is unsure about surgery, or even if you have a potential plan for surgery and you just want to have a second opinion about it. You know, I'm not going to interfere with those plans, but sometimes it can help provide some reassurance that, yes, this is the right thing to do or this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so we can we can certainly provide those opinions for anybody who's interested. That's amazing. Thank you so much for offering that. Wow. OK, very good. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you.